All right, guys. So um, we, we, we saw from what we were doing previously that in order to find the number of men with heights between 155 and 165, we would have to find the number of men for 155. So we do the same. We go on our x-axis. We look for the 155 from that point of our vertical line or dotted line. Then we go across to meet our our y-axis, which is our cumulative frequency axis. We we'll read the value from that. That gives you nine. We go to 165, draw our vertical line from 165 on the, the x-axis, moving right up to meet our curve. When, wherever we meet our curve, we draw our horizontal line coming across, and that would give us approximately one, that's approximately 70. So what we do now to get the number of men with heights between 155 or 165 is to subtract the lower value that you calculate for 155 from the upper value that you would have calculated for 165. And so the number of men would be approximately 70 minus minus nine, which would give you about 61, all right? So you would have approximately 61 men with heights between 155 and 165. All right, so we, we want to go now and look at what our next question is. So let, let us go back to the questions. All right, so the other question now is, how the number of men, the number of men with heights greater than 162. So of course, as before, we're going to look for that 162 on our x-axis. So all right, so here now, we find on our x-axis, 162 to be around here. Now, the, the value corresponding to that now on our y-axis, which is our cumulative frequency axis, would fall on the axis at about, say, 40, 41, somewhere there. Now the question asks the number of men, number of men with height greater than 162. Now the number of men with height 162 to, if you come across here, and if you want to call this approximately say 40 or 41, so this would be approximately 41. Or say approximately 42 then. Then, then what we need now would be all the men who have who have heights greater than 42. Now, can anybody tell me how you would go about calculate the number of men who have heights greater than 162? How would you determine that on your frequency axis? Sir, minus 42 from the hundred. Correct. So all you would do is subtract now 42 from 100 to get the number of men with heights greater than 162. So you'd have 42, 100 minus 42 would give you about 58. So that would be um, the number of men with heights greater than 162. All right. So these would give you approximately what a solution should be from your graph, all right? So remember, for the first question, it says the number of men with heights less than 157. And so when we match, 
we go on the the the, the x-axis where you have the the heights we find the 157 we match that to the cumulative frequency axis we would have got 15 but we know that 15 would be the number of men with height 157 so we have 15 men with that height but we didn't want the height of 157 we want heights um, which are less than 157 so we would have to go at least one below 15 which would be 14 men um, the cumulative frequency response now for heights uh, of men between 155 and 165, we see on, on our x-axis, we would look for 155, we get the value of nine on our frequency axis. So 155 corresponds to nine. Then we have for the 165, number of men correspond to 165 would be 70. So we simply now define the number of men between 155 and 165. We subtract the nine from the 70. So we get 61. So that would be 61 men would have between 155 and 165. And then now for the last one, as we say, we would subtract the number of men for 162 from 100. So 162 give us 42 men, or subtract 42 from 100. So we get 58 men with height greater than um, 162. All right? So everybody should be good with this. So let me see the hands of those who are confident enough that if you get questions like these on your cumulative frequency, curve, you'll be able to calculate them based on the table. All right, so not everybody is confident. All right, so what it means then, we would have to practice some of these questions, all right, which, which we'll do so as to um, help you to become a little bit more familiar of how to do this calculation. All right, moving along now. So we would have looked at two methods of um, finding averages. So we would have looked at the mean, we would have looked at the median, and now our final one is the mode. All right, now remember all of these methods will, will point to pretty much the same average. Because whichever method they use to find the average, the average pretty much will be the same. But there, there are there are disadvantages and advantages to to to, to these methods, right? So, um, when do we use which one? Is depending on <clears throat> what we are trying to find, all right? So, um, for the mode. In order to find the mode of a set of values or a set of data, what we do is look at the values of the data and pick out the one that occurs the most, right? So the value which has the most um, occurrence are the one which frequently occurs are the most frequently occurred value. That one is the mode. All right, so the mode is just looking at all the values and look at one, the one that occurs the most, and then you just pick out that value. So from a set of value, you just see which one occurs the most. Now, this may also leave us with different scenarios. So you may have a scenario where you have one value that occurred the most, but you may have another scenario where you may have two values occurring the most, or you may not have any value occurring more than any other value. So if you have a scenario where there is all the value occurring at the same number of um, frequency, then in that case, 
none of the value occur more than any of the other value. So in this case, we don't have any more than second place. All right, so that would be the second scenario where none of these values occur more than any of the others. So there is no mode in the second scenario. But the third scenario, you notice that you have two set of values that occur the most. So you would have six and three having the most occurrence, but they both occur the same number of times. So in this case, we have two values that occur the most. So we have two modes, all right? So that's scenario three. Now, if you have two modes, then it means that you would have more than one mode. So a set of values which has more, which has one mode is called unimodal. A set of values which has two modes is called bimodal. And what would you call a set of values that have many modes? Uh, repeat, please. If if you have if, if you have a set of value that only has one mode, we call it unimodal. A set of values that have, which have two modes, we call it bimodal. What would you call a set of values that have more than two modes? Some quad something, sir. Quad What could you call it? Multimodal. Multimodal. <laughs> All right. So, good try. So, a set of values um, which has more than two modes would be called multimodal. All right. So, um, so this is how we would define our modes. Now, the modes here would just refer to a set of value. But as we know, our set of values can be somewhat distributed in a frequency um, format. So in the case where we have a frequency distribution for the mode, we may not be able to just look and pick out the mode like this. So we'll have to use a different strategy when we are picking out modes for um, values that are frequently distributed. Now, <clears throat> the, 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 the method that we use for values that are in a frequency distribution, generally when we are looking for modes for frequency distribution, we generally construct the histogram. Now we would have met the histogram earlier and the histogram is a, is a graphical representation using bars. Now, the, 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 so it is a bar chart, but the histo histogram is a little bit different from most of the other bar charts in that you will have on both axes, you will have on the X axis, where you can look at the um the values that you are you are, you are concerned with, which we generally would call the x values, and then now on the y axis you would look at the frequencies. So for these histogram, you can have frequency in relation to the x values. Now. So our frequency, um, our histogram can be set up in two different ways. One where the, the height of the bar tells you the frequency, and one where the area of the bar tells you the frequency. So we would have looked at that in, in the previous class, and 
hopefully for those who are here, you will be able to make a distinction between those two tables, uh, two um, histograms. All right, so the area representing the frequency, so let us just look at a definition here. So we know what an histogram is. The histogram is a diagram which is used to represent a frequency distribution. Now, it consists of a set of rectangular rectangles whose, in one case, we can have the area representing the frequency of the various classes. And this would be when the rectangle when the rectangles are not of the same width. So when you have a histogram where all the bars are, are not of the same width, most likely they are using the area of those bars to give you the frequency. Now, in the other scenario where we use the height to represent the frequency of the classes, in this case, our rectangles will all be of the same width, right? So, so these are the two different ways how we can construct our histogram to represent our frequency distribution. Now, the one that is most frequently used, especially in exam, is the ones where we are using the height of the bars and all the rectangles will have the same width, right? But it doesn't mean that you cannot get scenario number one. But it is for you to know that histograms can be constructed in these two, two different ways. One where the area of the bars tell you the frequency. That means you have to literally calculate the area of the bar. Now remember these bars are rectangles, are rectangle bars. So to find area, you would have to multiply the length times the width of those bars to get the frequency. So in that kind of histogram, your vertical axis, the height on the vertical axis would not be the frequency, but instead the height on the vertical axis we will we'll call that the frequency density. So any histogram where you're using the area to represent frequency, the height of the bars would be the frequency density, all right? If we are using histogram, where we are using the height to represent the frequency, then that vertical axis will now have the frequency on it. And all the rectangles will have the same width. All right, so I hope that, I hope that is clear to you guys. All right, so histogram for a group distribution. A histogram for a group distribution may be drawn by using the mid, midpoints of the class interval as the center of the rectangle. Now, this would be a scenario where we are constructing a histogram using not the class midpoint, but we're using, we are using the boundary values. Now, we would have seen just from the previous, um, the previous average of median, we would have seen how the the boundary values are placed on our y-axis. So it's the same, same way we would put our boundary values on the on our x-axis. So notice that where we have these marks, these are our boundary values. So one boundary value is there, another boundary value here, and another boundary value here. All right, so when we are using the boundary values to construct our histogram, all the bars are going to have the same width, right? And, and so the class width would give you the width of the bar. Now, so the width of this bar, 
Um, all right, pardon me, guys. Where where I circle these things? These are not the actual boundary values that I've circled. The boundary values would be where the the rectangle actually starts. So I would have circled the wrong region. So the boundary value would be right here for that first class right here between the first and second class right here for the um between the second and third class and right here between the third and fourth class and right here and so on. All right, so our first bird boundary value would be 149.5. The same values that we would have used from the previous um cumulative frequency curve. So we have 149.5. The other one is 154.5. Now we use we use the class width, which is remember if you know how to um calculate the class width, it is the upper boundary minus the lower boundary. So when we subtract the lower boundary from the upper boundary, we get a class width of five centimeters. That's how we calculate the class width. Now, the width of the class gives you the, 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 the base of the rectangle. Remember, when we're talking about base of any geometric shape, the base of any geometric shape has to be the side or the width of the side. So the base of this shape that I would have constructed would be the side on which it is sitting on. All right, so the side that this box is sitting on would be down here. So this here is the base, all right? So for this bar, their base would be the side that they are sitting on. And we say the width of the base is the same as the class width, right? So the width of this bar would have a width of five centimeters. And that will give you the, the um the base of our rectangle. Now when 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 we're using the base to be the same. All of these bars going to have the, the width being the same for all of them. So if the width of these bars are all the same, it means then the height of these bars will tell you the frequency. All right, so in this histogram, we're actually using the histogram where all the bars have the same width and the frequency is determined just by the height. Now, if we want to find the height of the frequency or the height of the bar rather, all we need to do on top of the bar, we draw our line to meet our frequency axis. And then now you read the value from the frequency axis. So for this one, if we're given a rough estimate, this would have a frequency of say about eight. No, sorry, not eight. Halfway between this would be 10. Well, maybe it's about eight. All right, so let's say halfway between this is 10. So let's say that the height of this bar is about eight. So it would have a frequency of about eight. The height of this bar would be about 15. So that frequency would be 15. So all we are looking at is the height of your histogram given your frequency. All right, so that's how you find the, the frequency of a histogram where you're using the base. All right, now how do we use this to, to determine the mode? 
Now, when you are constructing this histogram, you would you would use the base based on the class width, right? So you would construct your rectangle with a class width based on your boundary values. How you find a class width again? You subtract the lower boundary values from the upper boundary values of, of that class. So you choose a class, you subtract the lower boundary value from the upper boundary value, and then you get the class width. After you get the class width now, your rectangle is going to, to have that width of five. Now, it is easy when you're constructing this. So all you do, you look at the height of these bars. So from, from that class, and this will be based on your class now. And um, to give you an idea what this histogram or where this histogram is coming from. It is coming from the same table that we use to find the, the cumulative frequency. And if you remember that table, then we have, we have a couple of classes, right? So all we do, from those class to calculate the boundary values, calculate the class with on the graph now, we construct our bar so that the base of the bar will extend from one boundary value to the next. So this first bar, the base of it starts at 149.5, for the first class and it ends at 154.5. Now the next bar is going to start at 154.5 and it's going to be ending at the next boundary value. And the next boundary value would be what? 159.5. And so you do that for all your bars. So the next boundary value would be about 164.5, and the other one would be 169.5, and the other one would be 174.5. So you extend your basis from boundary value to boundary value. Now, what you notice about the histogram is that all the sides of the histogram, all the sides of the bar, are touching each other. So that's a property of a histogram. The sides of the bars are all touching, touching each other. All right, in constructing, um, in determining the mode, we have to construct what we call our frequency polygon. And to find our fre frequency polygon, we're really going to use the middle of each of these bar, right? So if we're using the middle of the bars to construct our frequency polygon, so the frequency polygon is a second way of representing our frequency distribution. Now it is drawn, it is drawn by connecting the midpoint of the top of the rectangles in the histogram by a straight line as shown in this example. All right. So if this is our histogram and we are drawing our frequency polygon, then we are going to start at the top of each of these bar. We're going to find the midpoint of the top of the bar. So from outside the first bar, we're just going to take the same width so if you notice that we have this bar starting here and it ends here, but we from out here, we're going to take the same width, same class width on the line and we find the midpoint of that. So that's where we're going to start our first point. And then now from there, now we're going to draw a line at the top of each of the bar then we're going to connect those dots. So you connect all the dots. At the top of each bar, you find the midpoint of the bars. Put in your dot, you connect your dots. And this shape that you get is a 
frequency polygon. Now the frequency polygon is what we generally use to find the mode. And to find the mode, we generally look at the highest point of the frequency polygon. The highest point of the frequency polygon would give you the mode. So from here, you would know that your mode is somewhere about, for this particular polygon, your mode is approximately, approximately 20, 27, somewhere there. All right? So the highest point of your frequency polygon is used to determine your, your mode for your frequency distribution. So just let me recap now. In order to find your mode of a frequency distribution, a group distribution, what you do, you have to construct your histogram. And from your histogram, at the top of each histogram, you find the midpoints. And then you connect, connect those that to get a frequency polygon. And then the height, the highest point on that polygon give you, give you your mode. All right. Now we also have, for instance, in this scenario where they say are to draw a frequency polygon for the information given below, which is related to the age. So you would, you would construct from these and above you're given the classes and below you're given the frequencies. So you would have to find your boundary values and you would have to correspond them, your bars to the frequency. So you would have your frequency polygon looking like this. You connect the dots are the middle point of each bar. And notice in this frequency, um, this diagram, they didn't actually use the boundary values, but instead they use the midpoint of the bar. And you can do it that way too as well. All right, looking at now another frequency um, histogram. This is another scenario that, so we would have mentioned you plot your frequency polygon and you find the top to get your mode. So this on this frequency polygon, you notice at the top of it, the highest point is the mode. But there's another way that we can use our histogram to determine our mode. The other way is that you find the highest bar the highest bar in your histogram. And if you notice what is happening here, you draw a diagonal line from one lower end of that bar to the upper end of this bar and from the lower end to up here. And then now you draw a, a, a vertical line down through here and wherever that cuts your x-axis, that will give you your mode. All right. So is everybody clear as how we can use our histogram to determine our mode? So we have two ways. One, you plot a frequency polygon and the highest point on the frequency polygon give you your mode. The second way you look for the highest bar and you draw this diagonal line from corner to corner from the bars next to the highest bar. And then now you split a line down vertical to the point of where these two lines intersect downwards. And then you read off your value for the mode from your x-axis. Is that clear? Let me see the answer of those who understand what is being said about the mode. All right. All right. Now, all right, guys. So we have a little bit of time remaining. Now, for those who would have came late, 
Now, um, I'm going to talk a little bit now about the, the quiz.